Welcome to the Ride With Us podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Prescott Rodeo Grounds and the world's oldest rodeo. It's history, traditions, some storytelling, and all the events happening at the Rodeo Grounds. I'm your host, Greg Mingarelli. Thanks for riding with us today. We have a guest with us who has won the Prescott Frontier Days barrel racing in the past, the recent past, and she's uh, typically in the summer around the rodeo grounds quite a bit with lots of different activities that we'll talk about here on the podcast today. So welcome to the podcast, Sarah. Good to have you on with us today, Sarah Kiekeffer. Uh, how are we doing today? Very good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I know you had a lot going on at the ranch today, uh, as we talked about when we walked in. Always uh, lots of adventures uh, with some foals hitting the ground out there, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about your uh, horse program. But uh, just wanted to give the listeners a little background uh, on who you are. Uh, give us a little little flavor of uh, how you came to Prescott and how you've been involved with the rodeo. Um, my family moved here in 1986 from Colorado. So uh, we were horse people cattle people when we moved from California or Colorado, not California. And, uh, um, just got involved right away. Um, going to junior rodeos, high school rodeos. My dad worked on ranches around here. Um, so if we weren't at a rodeo on a weekend, we were either at a team rope in or, um, working at the ranch. Yeah. So you've been in Prescott pretty much, uh, most of your life here. Uh, and then, uh, you ran into a guy named Rick. Yep. Yeah, we met when we were probably 12 years old Okay. at a junior rodeo. Yeah, so we and we actually weren't friends um, till high school. His mom had a um, like a local high school rodeo group for the Prescott High School Rodeo. Us kids had to go out and get buckle sponsors and stuff. Um, so that's when he and I first started talking, but we didn't even start dating till after he graduated from high school. Met up when you were 12 at a junior rodeo. Yeah. Well, and it's, I'm sure those connections still happen. We still have a junior rodeo in the spring, and then the high school finals happens there in early June, uh, which is always good to see at the rodeo grounds. Uh, so you've been around the rodeo grounds, you know, for decades. Decades. Uh, I want to first talk just about being a contestant, because it's something our listeners, I think, would appreciate kind of that perspective. You know, they, they come at it from sitting in the grandstands, and they kind of see a little bit of what's going on, but they don't really know kind of the the behind the curtain, if you will, and kind of the back lot uh, of what happens with contestants uh, at the rodeo grounds. And I know you won a buckle there in mm -hmm. 2019. So talk a little bit about the world's oldest rodeo and kind of what it means to you to run on a Saturday. I know typically you run on a Saturday and, and maybe about the buckle that you won. Well, it's just, you know, when I was a kid in the summertime, there wasn't a lot to do in Prescott. It was pretty small. And when the, when the rodeo came to town, that was where everybody went and, you know, you didn't miss a performance. And um, Prescott's always gave the coolest buckles. So when, you know, growing up, that was always a dream that you got to win one of those buckles and it took me a long time. <laughs> How many years had you been running? Um, I bought my permit in 1998. So I think the first year I ran at Prescott was 1999. Okay. 99. So it was about 10 years before you got a buckle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had placed before that. Mm -hmm. I placed yeah. in some go arounds. Um, the average had always been a, a hard one for me because running two in one day, actually years ago, it used to be you were either uh, first and last. So you ran your first one, like the first performance, and then you came back the last uh -huh. performance. Okay. Um, that's how they, they kind of split it up or, um, it was one go around for a couple years. Um, so it's just, you know, it's always been a little different, but um, the way it's set up now, it really helps the contestants to kind of be in and out because there's so many other rodeos going on that week. Yep. Um, yeah. But it's just, it's one that you don't want to miss. Yep. So folks, if you're out there and you come to the rodeo on a Saturday, you're likely to see Sarah run the barrels uh, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night. Um, what's it like? to be in the arena on a Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening at the world's oldest rodeo. Mm, having two performances is always fun, especially with the hometown crowd. Yeah. Um, I like it better with my horse too. It gives them a little bit more time between runs. Uh, some of the other performances that girls run in the performance and then they run less than an hour later yep. in the slack right after. Um, but it's just, I love that Saturday yep. afternoon, Saturday evening. Right. 
sometimes it comes back and bites me in the butt if we have a monsoon. <laughs> True. Yeah. Well, I was going to get to the dirt, you know, uh, for Sarah and barrel racers, the dirt's kind of everything. Uh, they can be kind of snobby about it. Yes. Uh, I was just down in Queen Creek and, and Sarah ran down there and they've had the best dirt in the turquoise circuit, which is the Southwest area here, uh, last year, mm -hmm. I believe, which I told our guy who takes care of the arena, I was like, you know, it's kind of cheating because they have a roof over they have their a roof, arena. Yeah, they don't have to worry about <laughs> and rain. And they don't have as many performances either. <laughs> no. Uh, but anyway, I know that's kind of everything. How does Prescott stack up with a lot of rodeos that you do in, in terms of the dirt? It's gotten a lot better the last couple of years. Um, Prescott was kind of notorious for not having great ground. Mm -hmm. um, back when there was a racetrack a million years ago, when we had a racetrack there, um, there was a really good dirt guy then. His name was Ray Flynn. Um, then when he retired and they moved the track out, it just kind of, you know, they, the ground wasn't the priority for a long time. Um, then when was COVID? COVID was 2020. 2020. So yeah. in 2019, when I won the average, it was because the, the ground was not very good. And my horse could stand up on treacherous ground, and it was treacherous that year. Yep. And uh, then during COVID, we didn't have any events at the arena. Um, I talked to JC and asked if I could put on a barrel series before the, the rodeo because I knew that if the ground stayed untouched, it was not going to be good for the rodeo. Mm -hmm. um, so he agreed, let me put on a couple barrel races and we hired a, a tractor driver and he came in and he figured out and what he needed to do through those barrel races to make the ground better mm -hmm. for the rodeo. And then now that we have Mike and added some dirt in there, it's just every year gets better and better. Yep. Yeah. Mike Alderete has been with us, I think three rodeos now mm -hmm. and, uh, he does a great job. Of course, he was in New Mexico with Jim Dewey Brown over there and, and did a great job over there. So well, they Jim, got best ground, too. We did. stole him. Yeah, that's right. And Jim, of course, knew that and, and pulled him over here to Prescott. And we're so glad to have Mike uh, working the ground in the arena. And, you know, it can be challenging, Sarah. You mentioned uh, monsoon. Uh, monsoon typically hits 1st of July. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's the thing about barrel racing is uh, those first three or four perfs, uh, you might have great ground and then it, then it rains and you're running Saturday in the mud. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I remember one year, uh, Dalton, who's one of the pickup men, had his big old paint horse that he uses for bulls and a barrel racer. A couple racer of the barrel racers running, borrowed him. Yeah. <laughs> was stick, running him in the mud. So they didn't have to turn out. Yeah. yeah. So talk to us a little bit more about, uh, barrel racing specifically, um, do you raise your own horses? Have you bought horses? Are you are you training them yourself? And and what are give our listeners kind of an idea of what uh, values on a lot of these top horses? So I've had both. Um, I've bought horses. I've trained a couple. Um, the one I'm running right now, I I bought out of a dispersal sale and just took a chance on him, and he ended up working out for me. I was my plan was just to fix him and resell him. Um, but these horses anymore, they're worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like these horses that are going to the NFR, they're worth between three and five hundred thousand dollars, maybe more. I mean, I've, I heard of one selling for a million not long ago. Wow. Um, it was a mare that they could, you know, pull embryos and breed. But so when you have a horse that's worth that much money, ground is a big issue yep. because yep. one run can cripple them and they're done. Right. Yeah. Yeah, really important. I think our listeners would have no idea that uh, at least the top horses that go to the National Finals Rodeo are in the couple hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, but even in our rodeo, I'm assuming that there's horses in that arena for our rodeo that are running north of $50,000, mm -hmm. uh, running barrels out there. And to your point, the ground's got to be good to make sure they don't stumble or take a fall and injure a rider or the horse. Uh, at the world's oldest rodeo, Sarah, if I remember right, after half of the barrel racers, they work the ground again. Mm -hmm. yep. So um, it depends on how many people enter and the, the stock contractor and the circuit director can determine they, you can't go over 12 in a performance, but you can go, you know, 10 or 12 depending on, you know, what they want to run. Um, so at five or six, they will, it's great. You know, that most of the um, rodeos now 
they will stop and work the ground because used to be um, Prescott could get super deep. And um, if you were 12 out, you really didn't have a chance on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a big difference. I know I've seen lots of different variations where they're raking in between everyone or they run a tractor halfway mm -hmm. through. Uh, but really important that you don't get too much rutting. Yeah. It just levels the playing field. Yeah. And I assume it's a draw on when you run. Mm -hmm. So if you're first out, that's probably the best spot, right? right? Or if you're number seven after they worked it on after number six, mm -hmm. uh, would be a little bit better run. Um, I would assume one of your biggest accomplishments is the 2000 or 2019 uh, barrel racing title at World's Oldest Rodeo. Uh, but give us an idea of maybe another big venue you've been in that was uh, – kind of a highlight of your career um i've made the dodge national circuit finals twice um once in pocatello idaho and then the second time actually no i made it three times okay the second time was in florida the third time was supposed to be in florida but covid canceled it and then they rescheduled it the next year for Greeley, colorado mm -hmm. um so that's uh they have the turquoise circuit system and it's it's comprised of arizona new mexico the United States is split up into different circuits. Mm -hmm. um, and they take the champion barrel racer or the average champion to the, the national circuit finals. Yeah. So that circuit, the turquoise circuit in our case, uh, and that circuit across the United States really just helps those local cowboys and cowgirls uh, get points in their local area mm -hmm. with that circuit. Right. Yep. And, and encourages them to do that. And in our case for the uh, turquoise circuit finals, that's in camp Verde in early November. Mm -hmm. I assume you ran there last, mm -hmm. last time. Yep. 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 So, uh, have you ever, we've been talking a lot about barrel racing. Have you ever done breakaway mm -hmm. uh, roping? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you don't do that at the world's oldest rodeo. I haven't seen you do that. Anywhere. I have the last two okay. years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's about the only one I enter. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I'm more of a team roper, um, but I will enter a breakaway every so often. And yeah. I, what, since they've added the breakaway at Prescott, um, I've entered it. No, I haven't done any good yet. But. <laughs> well, keep at it. <laughs> yeah, I was really glad Jim Dewey uh, brought that in. Uh, I think I want to say 2021. Mm -hmm. Does that sound about right? Mm -hmm. Uh, when he started the breakaway roping and and uh, had some really good contestants coming in. And yeah. it's good to see. He likes to do that right after the tie down roping mm -hmm. strategically so that you see the calf, you know, run off after that uh, string breaks on the on the saddle horn. So uh, you mentioned uh, you started a barrel series in 2020. You still been mm -hmm. do, you know, every do year that? since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what does that comprise of? How many weekends and contestants? Um, I do it every it's weekly. I do a four week series on a Thursday night at the rodeo grounds. Um, and it's a open 4D. So it's open to anybody that wants to enter. A 4D is uh, whoever runs the fastest time that night. Then it's broke down into four divisions. So you have a half second split between each division. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like gambling or the lottery, you know, it's <laughs> see who wins and then go from there. How many contestants do you get typically? Oh, last year at one of them, I had almost a hundred girls. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, that time of year, all the Phoenix people are looking to get sure. out of Phoenix and come somewhere cooler for a night. And Yeah. So those are on Thursday nights, and tell me what months you're doing that. Um, the last week of May through, uh, what did that be? like? The, it's the week before the rodeo is the last one. So like the end of June. Uh -huh. So like May and June, really. I was just pointing that out for our listeners, that if you're in the neighborhood on a Thursday night in May or June, uh, you're welcome to pop in yeah, there and climb up into the grandstand. Free for anybody to watch. Free, free uh, opportunity to watch some good barrel racing. Uh, in May and June there. So uh, you you started out at the rodeo grounds at an early age. You've been kind of doing uh, world's oldest rodeo, this barrel series. You're there a lot. But one of the things that you are a part of is the legacy horse sale that mm -hmm. happens in September at the rodeo grounds. So give our listeners a little background of what that is and kind of when it occurs and, and what you're doing. So our family, or Rick's family, has been raising horses for over 80 years. Um, so we, we raise, raise a lot of horses. Um, we used to just sell private treaty to the public, and you'd have people show up, you know, anytime, and it'd be a, kind of an ordeal to try to sell a horse. Mm -hmm. So he and I decided, why don't we just do a production sale? And uh, so this will be our ninth year. 
And it was kind of a no brainer that if we were going to put on a production sale where we were going to put it, we were going to have it at the ranch because nobody would show up because they don't want to drive down our dirt road. Um, so we decided that, you know, the rodeo grounds was the best idea. And then we um, com- com- went in with Equifest that had already been established. We just felt that was a good weekend for the two events. But um, what we do is we bring in about 40 head of horses that um, come off of the ranches and some employee horses. And uh, we have everything from baby colts to brood mares to good saddle horses and, and rope horses. Yeah, I think a friend of mine did a, a purchase, a three three for one, if you will, where mm-hmm. it was a, a mare that was pregnant and had a foal on the ground as well. You do some of those towards the end of the sale. I've been there for uh, the last, I think, three years now, and it's a lot of fun. We do that uh, right there off the, the east end of the arena in a tent uh, for now until we get something permanent mm-hmm. built, which we'll, we'll do eventually. But uh, tell us a little bit more about what you guys are doing that weekend. There's some activity that, that kicks off Saturday where folks can kind of watch these horses work. Yeah, we uh, start Saturday morning with um, the team roping demos. So any horse that we rope on, we'll show them in the arena, roping live cattle. Mm-hmm. Then Equifest has some other events in the arena that day, uh, clinicians and demonstrations and stuff. And then in the afternoon, which is uh, pretty unique to our sale as we do a live branding demonstration. So we bring in cows and calves and and mm-hmm. rope the calves and drag them to the fire like they, we do on the ranch. Yeah. Show, we can showcase each horse that way. And then the sale's at 6.30 that night. Yeah, so this typically happens mid-September this year. So this year will be September 14th. September 14th. So if you're listening out there, mark your calendars. This is a great event to come to Equifest uh, for the weekend. Lots of different activities that happen in the main arena. And then the Legacy Horse Sale that Sarah's talking about happens, again, Saturday with some demonstrations and then Saturday night uh, with the sale, which is a lot of fun. Uh, you, you do have a bar there. And, we have and a bar. I've, we I, have a very colorful auctioneer and <laughs> yeah. everybody has a good time. It's a lot of fun. If you have no intention to buy a horse, it's still fun to come down there and see the horses come through the ring and listen to the auctioneer. Or have a few drinks and buy a horse. At, I, I've, I you, fell victim to yeah, that one Yeah, you did year. fall victim. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. It was uh, a lot of fun and our daughter enjoyed the horse. So uh, that's a great event and I appreciate it you guys doing that there at the rodeo mm-hmm. grounds and, and, uh, it's a great event for the public, uh, to come again for free, uh, to experience that, uh, horse sale. So you mentioned the ranch and, and you live out on a dirt road. People wouldn't head out there for the legacy horse sale, but give us a, a, a better idea of where the K4 is and, and kind of where you live out there. So we're right between Prescott and Seligman exactly mm-hmm. halfway, but it's on a dirt road and it's not very nice to drive down. Um, it's been in the family, like I said, over 80 years, Mm -hmm. um, just a great piece of country. We love it. And then uh, a couple of years ago, Rick and I bought, um, the lease at the diamond a ranch in Seligman, which is the Arizona's largest ranch. Mm -hmm. So we took over that place with all those cattle and, and a whole nother set of horses. Yeah. No, that's great. And, and you guys have been, uh, of course, buckle club members, a part of our booster club, uh, but you're also sponsors of the rodeo. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that venture that sponsors the rodeo and kind of how you've helped the rodeo out with that business. Uh, so we, it's a kind of a co-sponsorship between K4 Ranches and Gourmet Beef, which is our brick and mortar store here in town. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of years ago, we decided we would bring our ranch meat to the public. Mm-hmm. Um, it's single sourced and give everybody the opportunity to enjoy that that meat instead of just shipping it off somewhere else. Yeah. No, that's great. I'm glad you guys did that. You know, we're seeing a lot more of this uh, direct sale, you know, single source uh, beef. I see it happening a lot more over the, uh, across the country. And I think it's, it's really important. I want our listeners to know about this uh, because folks are typically looking for single source. They want to know where their meat's Mm -hmm. coming from. This is a great opportunity folks to, uh, go to K4 Gourmet Beef, which is out there off of uh, West Gurley Street near Casa Sanchez, and uh, some great beef out there. You know where it's coming from, coming from a local family, and we appreciate your support of the rodeo with K4 Ranches as well as K4 Gourmet Beef. Uh, there at the rodeo, we we always uh, look forward to having local businesses support the rodeo. Yeah, and it was just we, that was kind of a no brainer too. If yep. We're going to sponsor. We're going to 
do it that way. Right. So you're running down the road a lot, Sarah, you know, probably more in the summertime to rodeos. Um, give us one of your uh, stories of being on the road and out there running Gosh. Uh, from rodeo to rodeo. You've got to have some pretty crazy stories. Uh, huh, I can think of one. A couple, um, trying to think what year that was, 2012 or 2013. Mm-hmm. Me and a couple other girls decided we would – Enter up over the fourth, Prescott being the, our first one that we started at, at the beginning of the week. Um, I had a toter home at the time, so it's it's like a big box truck, you know, with a semi, and we had a big six horse trailer behind us. And I don't think we shut that truck off for like five days. Wow. We left here and went to um, Red Lodge, Montana, mm-hmm. straight there, and then from there we went to St. Paul and Malala, Oregon. And then turn around and went to West Jordan, Utah, to Window Rock. Wow, Window yep. Rock, Arizona. Yep, it was so, a big circle. Yeah. Well, and how many days was that? About five days. Or I something? don't. I don't even think it was five days. <laughs> it was less than that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that story because I don't think our listeners probably fully understand just how much driving time, particularly over the Fourth of July, mm-hmm. is involved. You talked about going up to Oregon and uh, all the way back down here into Arizona and Montana. And, uh, you know, during our rodeo, uh, there's a lot of rodeos happening up in the north, northwest. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's a little harder to get contestants down here to our rodeo. Jim's done a great job of increasing the purse, and I think he intends to continue to do that to make sure that we get the top contestants down at our rodeo. But uh, it's it's a lot of... It's a lot of driving. A lot of driving. And and what's unique to the barrel racers is we don't get to fly like the, the mm-hmm. cowboys do. Um, unless you have a couple horses and, and rigs scattered around, then you can fly. Yeah. But most of the girls, they have to drive. Yep. Whereas the calf ropers, you know, they or team ropers, they can fly in and, and ride somebody else's horse. Yep. You don't do that in the barrel racing world. Yeah, Sarah's talking about, you know, all the different events. Uh, you know, if you're a rough stock riding bareback or saddle bronc or bulls, you've got your bull rope and rigging and whatnot uh, that you could fly with and, mm-hmm. and get around the country pretty easily with because you're not hauling a horse with you. Uh, and even with some other timed events like the tie down roping, uh, the, the uh, steer wrestling or even team roping, uh, there's some times where you're sharing horses, particularly on steer, steer wrestling and mm-hmm. uh, tie down. Uh, I know when I watch the national finals rodeo, it's always fun for me to watch. You know, there'll be uh, each contestant coming through, and I'll count the horses. And there's only like three or four horses sometimes mm-hmm. running uh, all those different contestants for that uh, steer wrestling. But uh, for barrel racing, pretty unique, uh, where you've got a relationship with that horse, you know that horse, and you're not borrowing somebody else's horse mm-hmm. unless there's a lot of mud and you're using the pickup man's yep, exactly. bull horse <laughs> or, or a team roper's <laughs> heel horse. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, you got to make everyone with that rig and, and haul the horses down the road for, for all those events. So, well, we've covered a lot here. Anything else uh, on your mind with uh, the rodeo grounds? Any memories you have over there? Gosh, lots of memories there. Yeah. Started when you were uh, in high school or younger than younger that? Younger than actually. that, yeah. You yeah. Were j- junior rodeo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What changes have you seen over there that have been kind of significant in your mind? That's a lot of years. Well, one was the racetrack yeah, because everybody went to the races. Yep. That was the fun thing to do. Um, and then when the racetrack left, just, uh, you know, some of the changes with the rodeo, making it bigger and better, mm-hmm. um, which was something JC, you know, it was just a rodeo. And then yep. when, when he came in, he, he did get it to where it was a tour rodeo and the added money was better and better stock with yep. Christian was bringing better horses um, just, you know, the, the town getting behind it, that's, yeah. that's never changed. Yeah. Yeah. We have some amazing support in uh, Prescott and the Prescott area. And, and I think you're right. JC probably really was the one that moved the needle the most, you know, maybe about 20 years ago, I mm-hmm. want to say he was there for 16 Yep. Yeah. and, uh, JC did a lot to elevate, uh, JC Trujillo did a lot to elevate our rodeo. And, yeah kind of make it more professional and mm-hmm. and uh, bring up the quality uh, 
and Jim Dewey is kind of right in line with yep, JC. He's falling just right in line just to keep, you have to keep building or it'll, it'll yep. die. Yep. Well, very good. Uh, I sure appreciate you taking the time to be with us today and uh, sharing your perspective of uh, a barrel racer and a, and a champion in 2019. Um, congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing you out there this summer. So, uh, folks, if you're watching uh, the rodeo this summer, breakaway roping and uh, barrel racing, Sarah will be in the arena, so we'll be cheering her on. Always uh, nice to have a local fan favorite uh, in the arena. People will get pretty excited about that. Uh, so, again, thanks for, no for being on the show. Thank you. Well, thanks for listening to Ride With Us podcast. This is Greg Mingarelli, and we're signing off.